should see my screen now. Yes, it's showing up well. All right, so I'm going to start. Thanks for inviting me here uh, to give a presentation. Um, it's a unique opportunity to share this with a very broad audience, and I'm happy to do so. And thanks to all of the organizers for really having such a wonderful seminar series. Uh, how proteins find their way in cells? That's the question I'm, I'm asking today. And there, there are many systems where you can ask these questions. You can ask, how do proteins find their way in um, multi-protein complexes like uh, the ring structures that you have in the flagella? You can also ask that question for pattern formation uh, with proteins, like the formation of the FTS set ring that's responsible for uh, mid-plane location and cell division in E. coli. And uh, even if they are very different, one is very organized and the other one rather less organized kind of arrangement of proteins, I would say they kind of share that they are protein matter with a functional touch to them. And there are similar questions you can ask about them. You can ask how are these things assembled? How are they maintained? Uh, how can you actually control them? And maybe could you even explain the function of these biological machines and complexes in terms of physical principles? I won't have time to talk about uh, self-assembly and the flagellum, but if you're interested, there's an interesting, uh, there's a recent paper that we published where this is discussed, especially in context of the role of noise in finding a, a ring structure with a high yield. What I would like to do today is actually to focus on how you can explain protein patterns by accounting for the underlying reaction network and the self-organization within the confinement of a cell. So let's get started. This is a movie showing mean oscillations in E. coli cells. You might have seen that. It's an oscillation on about a minute time scale. What's fascinating about it is that it's just two proteins, namely MinD and MinE, that are responsible for that oscillation, which is actually a membrane-based protein pattern. It has a role, namely to localize midplane in a cell, because as you can see, there is density maxima at the poles and the minimum at the midplane. And it's exactly there where you then have the formation of a ring of other polymers called FTS set, and they then are responsible for cell division at midplane. That is not the only phenomenon actually where you do have pattern formation. Here's another example. This other example is from yeast, budding yeast to be precise. And underneath of this pattern forming system where you do have the formation of a polar cap, as you can see here, is not an ATPase like MinD, but a GTPase like CDC42. And similar as the MIN system, this polar pattern here serves as a template for the formation of uh, polymer structures here, a bundle of F-actin filaments, which then gives rise to budding of that, that yeast cell. And I could add actually more examples uh, on, on these kind of patterns. There are quite a few um, in bacterial cells as well as in eukaryotic cells. And to give you a feel of uh, what the underlying reaction network is, uh, let me explain it for the MIN system. As I said, I have just two proteins, MIN-D and MIN-E, but they have very different roles in the network to play. So if we look at the minimum kind of skeleton network uh, for these systems, at the heart of the network, you have this pair of an inactive and an active MIN-D protein. So what happens is only if the MIN protein is it's in its active ATP bound state, it can actually bind to the membrane. And once it's bound to the membrane, so from the cytosol to the membrane, then it has the ability to recruit MIN-D to the membrane. So you would have something like a positive feedback. The more MIN-D that appears on the membrane, the more you will shuffle to the membrane by, by that. And if that's the only thing happening, then 
the system would just flow over min proteins on the membrane. So the min E comes in. Min E is kind of an antagonist to, to min D. It's also recruited to the membrane by min D. And now it forms a dimer of min D and min E proteins. And then min E comes in because it's hydrolyzing min D. So in, in other words, it's switching min D off. And by doing so, by switching min D off, it actually uh, disintegrates the dimer and the dimer then falls off from the membrane back to the cytosol where the whole cycle then starts anew. And that's a basic cycle which was first uh, put up by Ned Wingreen and KC1. Now, if you think about it, uh, this is actually a very general design principle. Uh, what you do have is at the heart of both systems, there's an NTPase like MIND or CDC42, which is driving the chemical reactions. It's the element in the cycle which drives the system off detail, off equilibrium and breaks detail balance. On top of that, uh, there's a cycling here involved and the cycling is between the membrane and the cytosol via various types of chemical reactions. And they are different if you go to different species like E. coli or yeast cells or starfish and other systems. And last, if you look into the time scales, protein number on the time scale of about a minute, a few minutes, is actually a conserved quantity. There's neither production or degradation of proteins on that scale. All right, this is roughly the, the idea behind all these kind of patterns from a conceptual point of view. And if you want to analyze that in terms of math, you have to write down diffusion reaction equations, one for the membrane, the other one for the cytosol, and you also have something like a reactive boundary condition that couples the membrane dynamics as things attach or detach from or to the membrane from the cytosol. Now you can ask actually quite a few questions. And there's a lot of things one can study and uh, investigate in these systems. One is, and that will be a focus of what I'm talking about today, is what is the role of the specific chemical uh, reaction network that you have underlying the system. Then uh, because these um, patterns happen in different cellular geometries, you can ask what is the role of cell geometry? And there's a lot to say about that. You can also ask what's the role of evolution, meaning how did these protein networks come about and are there evolutionary differences between the networks in higher organisms and lower organisms? You can ask more of a synthetic cell question, whether you can actually use the insight you have in these systems to construct something like a minimal or a modular system. And finally, you know, being a theoretical physicist, uh, I'm of course interested in, are there maybe some general underlying principles uh, behind these patterns that we see in biological systems? And that said, the focus of today will be on these two things. What's the role of the reaction network? And are there maybe some general principles underlying the dynamics of that system. And let me start uh, in explaining it in terms of the simplest system I, I can imagine. So the simplest system I can imagine is one where you would have a membrane and a cytosol, and you just have one type of protein. And this one type of protein may be in its cytosolic form. So here in the cytosol, where the blue area is indicating what the cytosolic amount is of that protein, or it may be in a membrane form like so. So it's just one protein, and there's one interesting aspect of dynamics of proteins in a cell, namely that if you look at diffusion constants in the cytosol and diffusion constants on the membrane, they're quite different. They're vastly different, actually. On the membrane, you have something like 0.01 micrometer uh, squared per second, while in the cytosol, you have something like 10 micrometer squared per second. So orders of magnitude difference between them. And now let's look at that simple system in terms of pictures to explain 
what the basic ideas are. And the basic ideas are really phrased best in terms of equilibria. And there are two kinds of equilibria we have here. One is a chemical equilibrium, and the other one is a diffusive equilibrium. So if you look here, uh, and you have proteins which attach and detach from the membrane to the cytosol, you have a balance between the diffusive currents between the membrane and the cytosol and the chemical reaction gradients that you have in, in the system. Now let's do uh, a Gedanken experiment. And this Gedanken experiment is such that we divide the volume here into two containers that are separate here by a small wall. And now I'm asking in steps, what's the role of chemical equilibrium and what's the role of diffusive equilibrium? So let's start by a small perturbation, meaning I move proteins on the membrane, as you saw from the left to the right side, such that I now have in this right container a higher total density, while here I have a lower total density. And now let's assume that the reaction kinetics is such that if you have a higher total density, then attachment is favored on the right-hand side and vice versa. If you have a lower total density, detachment is favored. What then happens is uh, the chemical equilibrium that restores here is such that you have detachment on the left and you have attachment here on the right. And as you can see, you now have chemical equilibrium, but you have a disequilibrium in terms of the cytosolic densities. There's a higher amount on the left polar zone as compared to the right polar zone. So let's now put the two containers back together again. And then of course you have um, diffusive fluxes and those diffusive fluxes try to equilibrate the cytosolic concentration on the right and left hand side, but you're left still with a situation where you have a higher total density on the right and a lower total density on the left. So the whole thing starts again as I repeat that process in separating the system into two pieces. I have chemical equilibrium being restored in both of the containers on the left and on the right. And now I have again a situation where I have gradients both quite strongly on the membrane and also in the cytosol. And now actually the gradients on the membrane and the cytosol are comparable despite the fact that the diffusion constants are so different that the equilibrium is such that you have now diffusive flux balance both on the membrane and in the cytosol. And as an end result, you get a configuration where the system is then back at a equilibrium state, which is the final steady state of the system, where on the left, you would have something like a detachment zone of, polym of proteins, and on the right, you have an attachment zone of the proteins. So what you just saw is a instability uh, based on mass redistribution, and kind of the punchline that we have is that if you look into pattern formation in cells, you can understand most of it actually simply in terms of those attachment and detachment zones, which are coupled through gradients in the cytosol. And those gradients are, so to say, the transport mechanism that drives redistribution of mass from the left to the right-hand side. And that's as simple as I can put it in terms of the reaction kinetics. And now let's say we do have a system where we not have just one protein, but actually two proteins like MinD and MinE. And I have here put for you a situation where already you have an asymmetry between the left polar zone and the right polar zone, such that you have a higher membrane density here on the right as compared to the left. And that happens because both, if you remember from the reaction kinetics, both mean D and mean E are recruited to the membrane. So you have a positive feedback for both types of proteins, which then accumulate on the membrane. There's actually a prerequisite for that to happen. 
because min e is a counter player of min d by hydrolyzing it, it's actually kicking it off. And that means the whole process here can only start if min d is in abundance, because if it wouldn't be, min e would kick it off immediately. So one couldn't have a formation of an accumulation zone of min d in the first place. So right, so after a while, more of those min e and min d proteins will be accumulating. And at some point, uh, you have saturation of the min d e complexes. And now uh, the second process uh, kicks in, with it, which is ATP hydrolysis, that kicks off min d proteins and min e proteins into the cytosol. And now, as you can see from the arrows, there's a difference between what happens to min d and min e. Min e, because it doesn't have a switch, it's recycled immediately. And min e, because it has some period it needs to before it's activated, is accumulating here in the cytosol, forming a gradient, as you can see. And that gradient then drives the redistribution of min d mass from the left to the right. And as a consequence, what you have then, you have the formation of a polar zone on just the other side of the system. And then the whole cycle starts anew and you have this oscillatory pattern that goes from left to right on a continuous basis. So in essence, uh, this means there is, again, this attachment detachment uh, zone idea. And you have here an alternation of activation, uh, attachment and detachment in the system because of those two different roles the mean proteins have terms of their dynamics. Actually, these pictures I showed you, you can actually make them into a solid type of theory that we termed local equilibrium theory. And if you want to read about it, here's some references, or you may also consult lecture notes that I wrote recently together with Fridjof Browns, one of my, my students. Now, this is what you can get if you then do actual simulations. So you see you can reproduce the mean oscillations also quantitatively using these kind of reaction kinetics. So what Petra Schwille and Martin Lohse actually achieved some time ago is something quite fascinating. Namely, they were able to put those meat proteins out of um, the cell into a container where they could study them in vitro. And they saw these beautiful uh, spiral patterns in these in vitro systems which then really helped us as theoreticians a lot to analyze those systems theoretically because in those in vitro systems, unlike the in vivo system, you can vary parameters uh, over a quite range. And that uh, they did. They, they did for the min system by varying the relative ratio of min E to min D proteins. And this came as a big surprise because what you see here is that these patterns are actually stable over a very broad range of min E to min D ratios from 0.1 to 10 or something like that. And this didn't really agree with the theory as I just explained the uh, condition, the prerequisite for patterns to form from those theoretical ideas was that min E should be lower than min D in concentration. And that's not what you see here. It's a quite broad range of parameters where that happens. So we started looking uh, uh, in, into what could be. And there is some hints from structural biology of what might happen here. So I explained to you that min D shows a switch from an active to an inactive state. So here's the inactive state, here's the active state. And what data from structural biology suggests is that min E is not only triggering the switch from uh, an inactive to an act, uh, from active to an inactive state, it's actually the other way around as well. Min D seems to trigger a switch in the min E protein and transforming them from a latent state, you can think of this as a closed configuration, to something like a reactive state. And the point is in the latent configuration, the min E protein has no binding affinity or low binding affinity to min D. It also doesn't have the membrane targeting sequence folded out. 
So it's only weakly binding to the membrane. Well, so you have this here, you have this mutual switch of two proteins, and you wonder whether that might kind of give robustness to the system. It's kind of an awkward idea to in include that switch because if you look into data, that switch is very, very fast. It's on the order of 0.01 seconds. So you wouldn't guess based on chemical reaction kinetics that a 0.01 second switch has an effect on a pattern that happens on a minute. But still, we tried. So we analyzed that model. That means the original model we had to generalize to account for that latent state in addition to the reactive state. And you can go through the whole analysis, not in terms of pictures, but of course, in terms of equations. And what we did, and what Jonas did, Jonas Denk did, was a linear stability analysis. And that so, linear- uh, Sorry, Ervin, Ervin, just to jump in for one second, um, a five minute warning right now, okay? Thank you very much. That should be enough time. So this um, linear stability analysis showed us here as a function of the reaction rate, the recruitment rate of min E, and the recruitment rate of min E in the reactive state and latent state, that you can achieve quite a robustness compared to the skeleton model. To make the long story short here, the skeleton model is here, and the color indicates the range of ratios for which you can get patterns. Dark colors means large range, and light colors means a low range. And you can see if you make the system such that you have these two states with a large um, reactive rate for this state and the low rate for that state, you can go into a regime where patterns should exist. And that uh, then was a prediction which we um, yeah, put before Peter Schwillis' group and Simon Kretschmer actually, actually he managed to create mut mutants of min proteins. So what he did is he not only looked at the wild type min E, but he made mutants such that the min E protein loses the switch and only exists in a reactive state. Or mutants where it still has the switch, but uh, it doesn't have binding sites like the membrane targeting sequence is gone. And those are ideal systems now to check with our predictions. So, and here, here they are. If you have the wild type, you get this broad range of parameters where you see pattern formation. If you make the mutant that has no switch, you lose the robustness, you're back to a, a system which has only a weak range of protein ratios where you can see patterns. So this already uh, gave us confirmation of our ideas. And you also looked at systems where you have no membrane binding. And this tells you here that membrane binding is not really essential. The essential point is that you do have this switch. And if you combine the mutants, you actually see if you have no switch and no membrane binding, you're back to the skeleton model with the predictions of that model, namely that min E has to be lower in number than min D to get patterns. So this is uh, confirming our theoretical ideas in a very clear and, and vivid way. And now let's kind of close with, you know, what's the underlying mechanism for that? So what's different? Different here is that you have min E being in a latent form. And when it's latent, it means it's not binding uh, to the membrane, to the min D a lot. So you don't have this restriction here that min E has to be less than number than min D. But once the min E proteins start binding, they are activated by the min D proteins. And as a consequence of that activation, they form this reactive layer that's really confined to the vicinity of the zone of the membrane because the switching rate of the min E switch is so high. And that means you confine the proteins to that layer. Now, when they are confined, they are very active, reactive, so they lead to a dominance of the min E detachment at some point. And then once you uh, <clears throat> have detachment, you're back to the situation where things start anew uh, from, from the very beginning. And maybe I want to compare this with this here. 
which you, I guess, have seen. This is a hoverboard, and let me call this a hoverboard mechanism. I don't have time, I guess, to talk about other things, so let me conclude with this here. Uh, robustness through mutual switching is something you can achieve, even if protein switches are, are very, very fast. And we were speculating that this might be a common design principle for um, a rather broad range of protein systems. Here, this is a quote from Alan Turing that the real challenge in the field is not that you would like to understand how patterns form, but how patterns transform into other patterns. And just to show you a movie from Nick Da Fakri's lab, which shows the rowfish um, um, oocyte, starfish oocyte, and the starfish oocyte, as you saw, shows at the same time a mechanical wave and a protein wave. And we have some uh, preliminary, uh, or actually a paper on this, which is not published yet, but I guess I don't have time, Meredith, anymore to talk about this. Uh, Need to wind up, yeah. Wind up with a conclusion. And that conclusion uh, is, I hope I was able to show you that this mutual switching of proteins is essential for protein patterns, that you can understand that in terms of local equilibria. And this I didn't talk about, there's patterns forming patterns. This is a challenge ahead in the field. And also for those interested, uh, there's actually quite some similarity in principles to other systems, namely active matter systems. And here are the people who did the work. Um, I mean, Jakob Halatek, he really started this all with me back when he was a PhD student. He's part of most of, of what I told you today. Uh, Jonas Denk uh, did the work with the switch. Manon is working with Nikta Fakri on the starfish oocyte. And Fridjof developed a lot of the basic underlying physical principles for the local equilibrium theory. And these are our experimental collaboration partners, Petra, Lidivai, Kes, and Nikta. And I thank them for stimulating discussions and uh, keeping us honest as theoreticians. So thank you very much for listening in. Great, thank you. Um, so we, we have time for a couple of quick questions now, um, and then we probably won't get to all of them, but just a reminder, there'll be more informal discussion after the second talk. So, um, so first, Rudra Biswas asks if um, there's a simple way to see how the oscillations can arise from a purely dissipative process, um, and what is sort of the relative roles of energy input and of nonlinearity. So kind of from, yeah, slightly abstracting, is there okay. kind of a simple way to see that? Yeah. I think the simple way I try to explain with these pictures in terms of attachment and detachment zones, that's as simple as I can explain it. What you need as a prerequisite for those oscillations to appear to begin with is that you do have the NTP ASIS because that drives the system off thermal equilibrium and allows non-trivial steady states. If you wouldn't have an NTP ASIS, you would not have any of those patterns. So that's, that's the key element in the whole analysis. And then it's this recycling, as you see here, between the membrane and the cytosol uh, that leads to an oscillation in space, right? It's not an oscillation locally. It's an oscillation between polar zones. And it's this reshuffling between dominance of mean D attachment and dominance of mean E detachment and that then uh, balances the system in going into a oscillation-like zone. Okay, good. Uh, we'll do one more brief question. Um, uh, Kinjal Debiswas asks if the MINDI binding and unbinding to the membrane can be affected by membrane mechanics, like the curvature or the tension. Is anything known about that? Unfortunately not. It Meaning should... it's, it's not known? It's not known, but if you take a reconstituted system where you let MIND proteins attach to the membrane, so not a bacterial cell, a reconstituted system, Petra Schwiller was able to show with her group that then the whole cell starts oscillating. So there is a mechanical coupling 
between the min proteins and the vesicle, uh, but it's not known how this works in detail. 